children early lisp is vain, and parents hold him dead. Happy the home where prayer is heard, and praise is born to rise. This morning, I am extremely happy that you are again here with us to worship together. Yesterday, Sister Stuart took us into the presence of God. And this morning, we are going to continue to just worship and enjoy each other's company. Let us all bow our heads as we pray and invite God's presence with us again. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you that you have spared our lives another day. Thank you that you have been with us throughout the day and you have been blessing us with such wonderful messages that would encourage us to revive our worship experience in the morning with our families. So take charge, take control, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we would sing together under his wings. Under his wings, we are safe evermore. This morning, we encourage you to build an ark of salvation in your home. So be blessed as we worship together. May God continue to guide you throughout the day. God bless. Under his wings I'm safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempests are wild Still I can trust him, I know he will keep me He has redeemed me and I am his child under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings, what a refuge in sorrow, how the heart yearningly turns to its rest. Often when earth has no balm for my healing, there I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings. From his love can sever under his wings, my soul shall abide safely, abide forever under his wings. Oh, what precious enjoyment! There will I hide till life's trials are all Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore Under his wings, under his wings Who from his love can sever under his wings my soul shall abide safely abide forever under his wings my soul shall abide safely abide forever All right, so good morning, everybody. I am so happy 
to be able to share with you this very short devotional um, presentation. And I pray that God's word will be a blessing to your life and your day. I am reading from Psalm 91, and we'll take up from verse 1 and end at verse 8. The word of God says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him shall I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. The caption for our presentation this morning is build an ark of safety in your home. Let us pray before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this glorious opportunity to meet with you and to hear from you. As we seek, Lord, to build an ark of safety in our homes, we ask, Lord, that you'll provide clarity and that you'd lead and yield and lean our hearts toward the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Build an ark of safety or build an ark of salvation in your home. I love Psalms. I love their words, their shape, their beauty. They have provided for me hope in times of pain, rest in moments of distress, moments in the face of chaos, inspiration in times of unbelief, light in days of darkness, and content to define seasons of joy. They have contributed to my picture of God. Psalms such as the Lord is my shepherd, Psalms such as the Lord is my light and my salvation. They have contributed texture to my relationship with God. But there is no psalm that holds greater significance for me than Psalm 91. And no verse as inspirational as, it, as its first, which says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This Psalm of Moses contains words of praise and promise. Words that are also instructive and wise. And it's reflective of a gift that is passed on from a father to his sons, from a master to his apprentice, from a leader to his successor. And this psalm, though it contains promise, does not offer a blank check to anyone who wishes to apply it. But there are conditions. There is a condition. It does not guarantee the absence of distress. It does not guarantee that, that good people would not have uh, bad days. Hmm. Instead, in fact, this psalm guarantees that trouble will come. Sometimes it flies in and you don't see it coming. Sometimes you can prepare for it because 
it walks in. I have had a love-hate relationship with this psalm. It's, <laughs> in fact, I'm particularly challenged by verse 16, which says, and I'll read it for you. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. But what about Abel? His parents buried him. What about Elisha, who saw Elijah caught up in a whirlwind and chariots of fire? He dies from an illness. What about men who are cut down in the prime of their lives, such as John the Baptist and Stephen? Could it be that the claims of the psalm are less than genuine? Or is it that we have misread and so misrepresented what the Bible says? Is it that we have taken the promises out of context. You know, the devil tried that with Jesus. He says, jump, of course, from the highest point of the temple. And then begins to quote this psalm. He says, for doesn't God promise, isn't it written, that he will give his angels charge over thee, and in their arms shall they bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone? Jesus responds, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt, or thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. There's a, there's a context to this psalm. A context, a situation, and even a person that it is applied to. The situation. The disasters in Psalm 91 are described in verse 8 as, the rewards of the wicked. This must not be mistaken for the seasons of life that everyone must go through, whether or not they're a saint or a sinner. Hmm. This psalm, <laughs> this psalm implies that children of God will go through challenges just like everyone else. But the fact that the distress or the woes are related to as a reward of the wicked says to us that the woes of the passage reflect or are of a retributive nature. That is, the fate of the condemned, the destiny of the lost. You know, the Bible illustrates this, <laughs> this reality in the story of Noah. Mm -hmm. In this account... God is grieved to his heart. He's grieved by the degradation, by the corruption, by the brutal immor immorality of mankind. The Bible says that their wickedness is great. And the contents of their hearts are evil continually. Therefore, the reward of the wicked in this passage is judgment, is judgment in the form of a flood. This flood would destroy man and remove his effects from the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 8. And so God instructs Noah to build an ark, a vessel that would protect him and his family. A vessel that would house him and his family in times of trouble. There are eight persons that survived the flood. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. The story of the ark is a family life lesson. The events that led to Noah's qualification to build and board the ark begins with the story of Seth. Seth is the son of Adam. The Bible says of Seth, and to Seth, to him, and to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Set. This story of Set has two parts. The first part reveals the genealogy from Seth to Enoch, and then there's an interruption. 
The Bible doesn't focus on the relationship of these men and God. But the interruption says, and Enoch walks with God. Or, and Enoch walked with God. The second part takes us from Methuselah to Noah. And then again, there's an interruption. And in Genesis 6, 9, the Bible says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Isn't that interesting? The similarities between the two men are that they walked with God. Hmm. The fact that these two men are the interruptions of the census would suggest that they are descriptions. <laughs> that they are descriptions of the family. Hmm. What does that mean? It means that Noah walked with God because his father Lamech walked with God. And Lamech walked with God because his father, his father Enoch, uh, or his father Methuselah walked with God. And Methuselah walked with God because Enoch walked with God. And Enoch walked with God because his father Jared walked with God. And Jared walked with God because his father Mahalalil walked with God. And he walked with God because Canaan walked with God. And Canaan walked with God because his father, his father Enos walked with God. And Enos walked with God because Seth walked with God. Mm. It's a beautiful legacy. A legacy that suggests to us that, <laughs> that the best thing a father can give to his son, the best thing a, a, a woman can give to her daughters, the best thing parents can give to their children, the best thing that siblings can share among themselves is a legacy of walking with God. Hmm. It's an ark of safety. An ark of salvation. That is being built. From since the time of Seth. And, and, and what's, what's even more interesting. Is that, is that the passage Psalm 91. Implies that there are two groups of persons. There are those that survived the trial. And there are those who do not. And this story of Noah and the building of an ark that began from the time of Seth are, are just supposes or, or presupposes another story, the story of his brother Cain. For just as how Enoch walks with God and then later on his great-grandson Noah walks with God, Cain kills his brother and then his great-grandson kills a man. It's a remarkable story. It's a remarkable story because when you read of Cain's children and Cain's descendants, the legacy that they pass on and the gifts that they pass down are material. Cain's descendants invented the city. Cain's descendants invented metalwork. Cain's descendants were the first musicians. Cain's descendants were, were the first tent makers. Cain's descendants invented animal husbandry. Cain's descendants, it would seem, would have had material to pass down from generation to generation, while all Seth's descendants had was a, was a legacy of godliness. You know, sometimes we become enviable, or we, we, we begin to envy are the gifts that others pass down to their children. And sometimes we question ourselves and we question our relationship with God and we wonder how is it and why is it and, and, and how come oftentimes it appears that the people of the world uh, succeed at a higher level and perform at a greater level and even receive gifts that, are, that, that seem to be better and more substantial than the people of God. And then we have this story where what is passed down is not simply a tradition of worship. It's not simply a tradition of walking with God. But it's tools for survival. 
for the product of salvation is safety. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. But it's a rock that I've been taught to approach. It's a God that I've been instructed to love. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's hearing me, but if you are, I want you to see the spirit of Psalm 91, a gift passed down from generation to generation, a word of instruction and wisdom. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If I must restate it, if I must restate it, it will be that there must be a foundation before there can be expectation. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, to dwell means to remain, it means to inhabit, it means to reside. It is the place that you live, not the place that you visit. Mm. The secret place of the Most High. So, so the Bible says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. So he remains, he lives, he, 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 he lives, he inhabits. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. This secret place of the Most High is not a place that is simply owned by the Most High. It is not a place that, that is simply associated with the Most High. No, this secret place of the Most High is a place that is found in God. Mm. It's consistent with the psalmist who says God is our refuge and fortress. It's consistent with the psalmist who says you are my hiding place. It's consistent with Paul on Mars Hill who would suggest that in God, not with God, not through God, not simply by God, but in God we move and, and we live and we have our being. And so it is possible that we can occupy the same space but be in a different place. Mm -hmm. Because... <laughs> While others are focused on, 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 on the things of this world, it could be that, that I'm focused, that my mind remains on God. That's why when trouble comes, you're not budged. That's why when issues face you, you are not, you are not distressed because you've understood and you've realized that he will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God. And so... He who dwells, the Bible tells us, is the one who abides. He who dwells in the secret place abides in the shadow. Please get that. Because to abide means to spend the night. Mm. In other words, the one who remains is the one who's qualified to spend the night. That's a point of worship. That's a point of family worship. That's a point of Friday evening worship. That's a point of family prayer. We're building an ark. It's the best gift you could give your children. It's the best gift you can give your spouse. I tell you what, the best thing I remember about my father is waking up early one morning, heading into the living room, seeing him there on his knees before the sun came up, before light came in, before the day got busy, seeing him on his knees calling his children by name and asking God to bless them. This instructed me on what it means to be a man, what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a father. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. The context 
trouble is coming trouble is coming but there's a person that can survive there's a family that can survive and you know what it could be your family it could be your family it could be my family may God bless you as you seek to dwell and then when the time comes you will abide amen As we come to the end of our worship family, let us pray. Father, now God, which art in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for our home. We thank you, dear God, that you indeed have given us a home that is blessed. We seek your forgiveness, your continued forgiveness. We seek your peace. We seek your help. As we continue to rebuild our altar, as we continue to place our children our husbands, Father, and all other spouses before you. In the name of Jesus, we seek your anointing upon the home, upon the people therein, your blessings upon everything that concerns us as we take you at your word. We trust you. We believe that we are under your wings. We believe that in it we are safely abiding, dear God. And because we have that belief, we are asking you, to heal where healing is needed. Children, protect their father from not only this pandemic, but from all other non-communicable and lifestyle diseases. We ask for that transformation in every sphere of our lives so that indeed we can become the salt of the earth, so that we can flavor the lives of those around us as we have allowed you through our worship experience this morning to flavor us. Oh, Father, we are the light of the world. We are in need of your presence in our workplaces. We need you, dear Father, in the schools as our children are in the Zoom platforms learning, dear God. E-learning is hard for many of our children, but we ask that you help them to adjust, understanding that you are the all-sufficient God. So, Father, we give you our insufficient selves and ask that you be our sufficiency. Divine intervention is needed in all corners, all spheres of our lives. And we ask that you intervene. But most of all, Father, help us not to get weary in getting up in the morning and seeking your face worshiping you in the beauty of your holiness allowing you to energize us to prepare us for the day for the week for the month for the year day by day and with each passing moment help us to find strength in your presence coming before you not as an individual only but as families in god thank you father thank you for everything thank you for your word thank you for the blessings and thank you that soon and very soon we will see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.